so here in this presentation, what I'm going to present to you is you saw on the gene page uh, that we have uh, information of presence of expression with FDR value and expression score. And I'm going to dig more into the statistical analysis that we do to generate this information on the BG website. Uh, okay, so this is an overview of the, of the BG pipeline. So we integrate different data types, notably bulk RNA-seq and single cell RNA-seq, but also affymetrics data, EST, in situ stabilization. We do a lot of quality control and condition filtering to keep only healthy wild type data of high quality. And then we reanalyze all this data to detect active signal of expression. And this is this part I'm going to, to present now, especially for RNA-C data, both bulk and single cell. So yeah, our question is how can we detect the condition where a gene is actively expressed? So just to get back to basic molecular biology, uh, so here on the DNA, you would have like promoter sequence uh, nearby a gene, and you have a transcription factor binding to this promoter to activate or suppress expression of this gene. And when the gene expression is activated, you will have the RNA polymeras uh, providing or uh, generating the mRNA through transcription. And then again, a ribosome binding to this mRNA to activate the translation and produce the protein. So the point is that at each of these steps, this is a molecular binding processes that are all stochastic. So you would have a binding affinity representing a probability of the transcription factor of binding to this promoter. Or here again, the ribosome would have a likelihood of binding to the mRNA to produce a protein. So all of these processes are stochastic. And that leads to have variation in, in gene expression. So for instance, here, it was a study uh, looking at the expression of a GFP in yeast over time. And each line here is the expression level in one yeast cell. And you can see that this expression vary a lot over time, even though they didn't do anything. They didn't, do the, they didn't change the condition uh, when they observed this expression. And so here in this graph, what they did in this experiment is that in each cell, they incorporated either a yellow fluorescent protein or a cyan fluorescent protein. And they tried to see, and so these two genes were uh, uh, under the control of the same promoter. And they were trying to see how there is a variation between uh, uh, the expression of these two genes under control of the same promoter. Because the idea is that there is a viability due to stochasticity, so it's just the inherent molecular process, and there is a viability due to external resources available, such as the ribosomes have to be available for translation, and if they are all busy on other genes, they cannot do the translation for your actual protein, or maybe you don't have the nutrients available to, to generate the protein. So there are these two kinds uh, of, of, uh, of uh, limitation, uh, intrinsic limitation, which are the sto stochasticity of the molecular process and external extrinsic uh, limitation that are because of the availability of resource. And here, basically, you can see that there is a dispersion of this measurement of the level of expression of one of the fluorescent protein as compared to the expression of the other fluorescent protein. So here, there is a dispersion along the diagonal of this graph and orthogonal to the diagonal of this axe. And here, I'm going to ask you a bit of a tricky question, uh, just to see if you have an idea of what it represents. So I'm going to have to switch often like that. Sorry. So I check my screen uh, in Firefox. So I'm going to ask you a question. So if you take the master document, uh, here you have the second presentation with a link to the activities and that will lead you to this page. And for this first part, you can go to the WooClap. Mark, if you can activate the WooClap maybe, or I can do it so that I will share the result maybe. Yeah, maybe you can activate the, the WooClap and I will share the result when it's done. So I ask you uh, on the graph that I showed. Uh, well, the WooClap is active. Okay, thanks. So on the diagonal, does it represent intrinsic or extrinsic uh, noise of expression or both? 
And on the axe orthogonal to the diagonal, does it represent intrinsic, so stochastic processes, or extrinsic, so resource limitation? Uh, so just to get an idea of how you perceive that, and then I'm going to detail this, this graph. So please let me know, Mark, when it's over so that I can click on the link. 20 seconds left. Yeah. Vote, vote, vote. <laughs> 10 seconds left. Many people haven't voted. Yeah, you don't have the figure uh, display, so that's... Five, four, three, two, one. Bam. Okay. I cannot see the result here. Okay, uh, I will do better. Can you share the result, Mark, please? Yeah, it is pretty simple. So you didn't yet yeah, take any risk and say both. Uh, okay, so actually I'm gonna show you the result. It's not both. Uh, can you stop the sharing? Maybe I'm gonna manage to share both my Firefox and my presentation. Yeah, so getting back at this, actually along this axe, the diagonal axe is the extrinsic noise uh, because it means that the variation is correlated between the two genes, meaning that the resource available were limiting for both the genes at the same time, while the intrinsic noise, which is really the stochastic molecular process, it should be uncorrelated between these two genes, even though they are under control of the same promoter, it will affect the two genes differently because it's totally random. So you have this random noise uncorrelated between the two genes and this non-random noise, depending on resource availability, that will be correlating between these two genes. So what I wanted to, to, to show you here actually is just that gene expression is noisy. There is a variation of the gene expression process that is not like uh, intended in a way, well, gene noise can be a feature of some genes, but just to say that then to detect whether an expression is active, is it active when the gene expression is as low as in this cell or active when it is as high that in those cells? So it's actually a trick question to answer. So this is a first kind of noise, which is the biological noise. But then we also have technical noise. So here I show you uh, a preparation of a RNA-seq library. So you have like, you have your cells, you extract your RNA, uh, and then you capture specific RNA species. So in most experiments, you will have a poly A selection. So you will get only mature uh, protein coding genes, RNA, mRNAs, or you can have a ribo depletion to remove the ribosomal mRNA, but keep all the other species. And then you will do the, the reverse transcription to get your uh, cDNA. And based on that, you will build adapters, do PCR amplification, and do the sequencing. And then after that, you will have the bioinformatics analysis. You will have your sequence reads. You will try to align them to your genome and then quantify the abundance of expression of your different genes. And at each of these steps, uh, you will have noise introduced. So now if you go back to the Google Doc, so you see my, uh, my browser here, right? Right, right, we see it. Okay. So if you go back to this document, you have a second question here, why I ask you to think about what are the different sources possible of technical noise in an RNA-seq experiment. So please, in this, in this table, fill your name and, and propose some source of technical noise in RNA-seq experiment. And I show back my screen. So maybe this one. So you have these two steps, the library preparation step and the bioinformatics analysis step. So I give you a minute or so to answer.
Okay, you have uh, lots of suggestions. So I try reading what you, what you put. So first is time of sampling. I would say time of sampling, in my opinion, would be more a biological noise uh, because, yeah, uh, based on circadian rhythm, for instance, we have a variability of gene expression, but that will not be due uh, to the library preparation step or to the bioinformatic pipeline analysis instead. That will really be the actual variation in gene expression. So then you have batches in library preparation, different hands extracting the material, different dates or ingredients. Yes, exactly. That's a big source of variability of technical noise. And this is why most of the time you need replicates. In good experiments, you always have one sample and you would do technical replicates just for the sake of identifying this technical noise. Actually, in a lot of experiments, you don't have such replicates using a same biological sample. So you need a method that can accommodate this problem. So sample preparation, library construction, yes, that's all technical noise source. State of the cells, in my opinion, that's more a biological variation. Uh, and then different technician, RNA isolation, kit lots, exactly. Uh, RNA extraction, library preparation, cDNA synthesis, effect of batches. So exactly all of that are, are sources of technical noise and level of gene expression, very low versus very high, that will be a biological variation. That wouldn't be a technical variation due to the preparation, the techniques of, of sequencing uh, the, the cDNA. Uh, okay, so I just wanted to emphasize that we always have in gene expression measurement, these two sources of noise, a biological noise, which is due to the st stochasticity of the process, and the availability of the resources and the technical noise due to everything that you mentioned during all the steps. So yeah, I just cited a bit. So here it's more the, the noise for the bioinformatic analysis, for instance. Uh, you, you could have errors in reads or errors in read mapping. You would have reads that are ambiguous and can map to different parts of the genome. And depending on the genome quality or the genome assembly, you would have different mapping uh, occurring. So all of that are sources of technical noise. Uh, but so again, the question is, at which point can you say that the gene, yes, it is actively expressed uh, over background stochastic transcriptional noise and over technical noise? Uh, I'm just checking, yeah. Okay, so what we want to do in BG, as you saw on the gene page, Mark presented the, that before, we want to say where a gene is active. And it, in a way, we want to transform all the data a bit like in-situ abilization data, as I show here, it's an in-situ abilization from Zitfin in a zebrafish embryo, and the spots here are zone of active expression for a given gene. And in a way, we want to transform all our data in such a way to have area where we know that a gene is actively expressed, and then it is an information that is easily comparable between genes and between species. So I'm going to show you how we do that from bulk analytic data and also from single cell RNA-seq data. Uh, so just showing you again the RNA-seq pipeline. So we extract the DNA, get the mRNA, do the fragmentation, uh, so the sequencing, and then the alignment to genome. And from, from this, then we get reads mapped to, to, to genome. And the question is that, at which point do you consider a gene as expressed? So in most uh, experiments, in most analyses, author of, often use an arbitrary cutoff. So they use an arbitrary cutoff on the expression level, and then they say, okay, above this cutoff, the gene is actively expressed. But it is very unlikely that one threshold can, can fit all situations of gene expression, all different cell types, or all different species, or all different experimental conditions. And actually, there is very little consensus on what is a good value to consider that a gene is actively expressed. So uh, what I'm asking you here now, if you go back to the Google Doc, I'm asking you what is for you an appropriate threshold to consider a gene as actively expressed. So for instance, that could be, I don't know, I say whatever, that could be 
above 10 TPM. So TPM is a unit in a RNA seq analysis, it's the unit of gene expression level. FPKM is as well, but you also have the unnormalized read count. For instance, do you consider a gene as expressed as soon as you have one read map to a gene or 10 reads map to a gene? So if you could please enter here in this document, uh, what do you expect to be a good threshold to consider a gene as expressed? So again, maybe like 10 TPMs, for instance, or 100 reads mapped to the gene. Or maybe you have absolutely no idea, but if you have a guess, please provide it here. <clears throat> So thanks for taking the risk of entering an answer while you have no idea. <laughs> Maybe if you're a bit uh, shy of putting an answer, you can put in, just not put your name. Yeah, yeah, it's not mandatory. It's more to know who we are interacted with. But it's not to put some peer pressure or whatever. I'll give you a, a bit more time if someone else wants to take a chance. Okay, so I, I take your answers and most of your answers, sorry, there is a last answer, but I will comment uh, as it is uh, written. So most of your answers uh, consider read counts. So read counts would be, would be a, a difficult unit to use because it's unnormalized per gene length and library size. So if you have a library with 100 million reads, what does it mean to have 10 reads or 100 reads mapped to a gene. And also if you have a very long gene and the reads are short, maybe it's very easy for a very long gene to just to stochastically generate 30 reads or 20 reads. And really it depends on the gene length and on the depth of sequencing. So unnormalized read counts would not be a good measurement uh, to, to see activity of, of the gene. So usually that should be a normalized uh, unit such as TPM. TPM is the default normalized unit in, in RNA-seq uh, gene expression study. And I see here, for instance, over 10 TPM. So 10 TPM would be actually yeah, quite high, but in some studies it can happen. In most studies, it is one or two TPM. But again, very little consensus. The most robust experiment analysis I saw were suggesting two TPM as a good overall measurement in human. Uh, so in most studies, you would see that over one or two TPM, you consider the gene as expressed, and then you use those genes in downstream analysis, uh, such as for a differential expression analysis. Here I see three standard deviation over average expression. For me, that will be more related to uh, over expression, differential expression analysis. So you would say that your gene here is, is, is Overexpress as compared to the other sample, but that wouldn't tell you whether a gene is active or not. Maybe a, a gene is below the average expression, but still actively expressed in the context of that gene, which might be very lowly expressed all the time, but still very important. So, so yes, thank you for giving that. So it, it shows that it's very not clear where you can consider, when can you consider a gene as actively expressed. So here I show you a figure from a recent paper of our lab showing the true positive, uh, the true discovery rate and the false discovery rate uh, at different threshold, TPM thresholds like that. So as the baseline uh, of the gold standard for the truth 
uh, we use ribo ribosec uh, data in mouse liver. So we have ribosec data, which allow to really identify the mRNA that have been translated. So uh, you get the mRNA that were protected by the ribosome. So the mRNA that were being actively translated at the time of the, of the library preparation. So it's really the baseline of the truth of where which genes were actively expressed. And so we compare that to RNA-seq data. We use 89 RNA-seq libraries in mouse liver and apply different cutoff of 0.5 TPM to 10.5 TPM and compare that to this truth provided by the ribosec data. And you can see that for a high value of TPM such as 10, uh, you have a very, very low false discovery rate because you're very stringent. You consider only very high expression as being truly actively expressed, but you have a, a true discovery rate of 75%. So you miss, a, it, miss, it means that you miss a lot of genes that were actively expressed. And on the other side, if you take a very low cutoff, well, of course, you will have almost all genes uh, that are actively expressed, but at the cost of a high false discovery rate. So you will have a lot of false positive in your result. So you see it's a bit, it's a bit tricky to define a threshold like that, and usually it's one or two. So you can see that indeed with two, you have a good balance of true positive and false, uh, false uh, positive. Uh, and this is looking at all the species in BG. Uh, so it is a box plot for each of the 52 species in BG here. It's the percentage of protein coding genes that are considered as expressed, actively expressed using a threshold of two TPM across all the RNA-seq libraries integrated in BG. And you can see that with this threshold, you have a huge dispersion for some species. So here it's human and you have a lot of libraries in which you will have 0% of protein coding genes considered as expressed with this two TPM threshold. So this library preparation or the sample led to have a very high level, average level of expression. And if you define a threshold of two TPM, none of your genes are going to pass this threshold. Uh, for some species, overall, the, 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 the median, uh, percentage of protein coding genes considered express is quite low. Usually you would expect something like 70, 70% of your protein coding genes as actively expressed. So, and you can see that there is a high variability between the different species. So, okay. So now I'm going to show you how we do that in BG, uh, how we determine a level of active expression in any RNA-seq library and in any species. Before that, before showing you what, what we do, how we do that, I'm going to ask you a question on WooClap. So Mark, if you can activate the WooClap, maybe. Um, I'm going to ask you, if you prepare an RNA-seq library, sequence it, what do you expect to find in your results? Do you expect to find only read, reads mapped only to genic regions? Do you expect to find reads map also to other regions of the genome, such as intronic regions, intergenic regions? So, so please uh, follow this link here. Uh, Mark, activate the vote and vote for what do you expect to find as result uh, from RNA-seq libraries? Which genomic features are you going to find when you map your reads to your genome? Okay, the vote is activated and one person has voted. When I stop the sharing so that you can share the result, Mark. Okay, I'll do that when we get to the end of the time. Yeah. So the results are pretty stable. Okay. Okay, and I forgot to mention that multiple answers were allowed, so maybe that tricked you. So most of you answer protein coding genes. 
as well non-protein coding genes. Okay. And actually, what is more surprising is that from RNA-seq library, you will also find reads mapped to intronic regions and intergenic regions. It is surprising because we're supposed to have captured only mature mRNA, so with intronic regions removed. Uh, and intergenic regions, they are not supposed to be expressed at all. And yet, we find some expression levels, some reads map, mapping to intergenic and intronic regions. So you can, I'm going to show, share my screen again. Okay, so this is here. So this is a density plot uh, of, of uh, the measurement of reads mapped to the genome. So here you have the uh, log RPK aim. So it was an expression uh, level unit used at the beginning of uh, RNA-seq, uh, where RNA-seq started to exist, uh, it has some floats. So now it's TPM that is used. But in this paper, it was still RPKM. So you get the expression level here in log RPKM and the density. And so here, uh, the, this line here is the exonic region. So what you expect. But you can see that you still have expression level for intronic regions. So this one is intronic and for intergenic regions. So it is surprising, but again, the expression is a noisy process. And just randomly, you could have uh, yeah, uh, RNA polymerase binding to an accessible intergenic region just by chance, basically. And you will find some, some, yeah, some reads mapping to this region of the genome. So here, what I want to show you as well is that you get this distribution, this density for exonic regions, and you see here a shoulder on the left of the distribution. And there, this is very typical. In most rna libraries, when you look at the density of, your, of the expression level of genes, you will see this shoulder on the left here. And in this paper, what the authors hypothesized, it, it was that this shoulder here and this peak on the right were actually the sum of two distribution, uh, a class of what they call lowly expressed genes and a class of what they call highly expressed genes. And, and these lowly expressed genes here, when they look at them, they show all uh, characteristic of non-actively expressed genes. So uh, the, the chromatin was not accessible or the uh, histone methylation marks were consistent with the genes not being expressed. So the genes was not actively being expressed when looking at these features, but yet you have some expression level associated to them. And what we noticed actually is that this distribution here of the lowly expressed genes, well, they match closely the level of expression of intergenic regions. And intergenic regions in well annotated genomes, well, if they don't contain any genes, they are not supposed to be expressed, right? So probably by using the expression level of intergenic regions, we can have an estimate of a threshold above which genes are actively expressed. So this is what we do in BG. So here I show you this density plot generated by us from a Drosophila melanogaster library. So this is a library integrated in BG. Again, you can see here this, this shoulder on the left for, for genes. Uh, here it's protein coding genes. So it's even lower. And this peak of expression of actively expressed genes. And in blue, you have the intergenic region distribution. So you can see that here, for instance, you, have, you would have a higher level expression here for intergenic region on average than for protein coding genes. So probably the protein coding genes here, they are not actively expressed. It's just expression noise. So what we do is that we estimate the distribution of expression level of intergenic regions, and then we compute a z-score uh, as the standard deviation uh, so you, we look at the TPM value for your gene, and we compare that to the, to the, to the distribution of intergenic regions. So we, use, we compute the z-score based on the distribution of intergenic regions. And from there, we compute a p-value, which means now that using this approach at each TPM level here, we can give you a p-value that you are actively related to the hypothesis that you are actively expressed or not actively expressed. Uh, I'm just checking what, yeah. 
Okay, and this is the result here. So here, this is what I show you earlier, the percentage of protein coding gene in all RNA-seq libraries for all the species integrated in BG. So this was with a TPM threshold of two TPM. And this is by applying our method of using intergenic, intergenic regions to estimate the background noise and have a p-value for the hypothesis of active expression. And here you can see that first, it's much more consistent between species. You have much less dispersion. So probably it's a good indication that the method is maybe more robust across species. Here for human, uh, you have less of a dispersion like that, and you have no libraries showing expression for no genes actually. So looking at these graphs, you can already have an idea that probably our method is more robust across samples and across species. I'm just checking, uh, yeah, I'm just checking the question I ask you afterward because since I don't have the presenter mode, I don't remember exactly where I put the question. Uh, so here again, it's uh, as the previous graph I showed you. So this is using a TPM cutoff. This is the exact same graph I showed you earlier. And then this is using our approach. Uh, and the cutoff here are p-values based on this comparison to the, to, the, to the distribution of intergenic regions. So here uh, with the lowest cutoff, so the most stringent cutoff, you will see here that we have a very low false positive rate and a quite like good average true positive rate. So if we look at this uh, p-value cutoff of uh, 10 minus three, Probably it's a bit equivalent, as you can see, to a, a, a cutoff or one or two TPM. So here that will achieve probably a good balance of false positive and true positive. Uh, so here, the advantage here is that it's not arbitrary. You, you set a, a threshold on a p-value and you have a statistical analysis, a statistical hypothesis that you can validate. And that's going to be a much more uh, robust across samples. So to show you that, uh, here is the distribution of, so it's again a box plot of the percentage of protein coding genes considered uh, as expressed, and it's in human blood samples from GTEC. So if you, lose, if you use this 2 TPM threshold on these human blood samples coming from GTEC, you have this distribution in the different libraries of the percentage of protein coding genes expressed, and you will have an average like 30% of the genes considered uh, as expressed. While if you use our method, you will get a much more normal as expected in other organs, other samples, uh, level uh, percentage of protein coding genes considered as expressed. And it's because in blood, you have uh, hemoglobin uh, genes, all the reads, like 80% of the reads map to those genes. Uh, and, and actually you do globin depletion. Usually when you prepare a blood sample, you do globin depletion to remove the threads that you capture all your signals and will not allow you to look at expression of other genes. But we actually realized that in GTEC, some samples were prepared with globin depletion, some were not. And so this leads to this high variability and, and actually our method accommodates the fact that you have either globin depletion or not, it doesn't matter because the intergenic noise is going to be modified depending on whether you have 80% of your reads map to globin genes or not. The intergenic region noise estimate would vary accordingly and allow you to recapitulate a proper signal with a lot, a lot, not a lot of dispersion. And <clears throat> so I think here I had a question. Um, yeah, maybe actually I was over enthusiastic. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, that's what this question. Yeah, this is why I was a bit lost. So I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, with this method based on inter intergenic region estimate, what limitations could you expect in using this method? So I know it's a tough question because, I mean, you're not familiar, so it's, it's this question here. I know you're not familiar with, with our method. I just presented an introduction, but if you think about it, so we use 
intergenic regions defined by genome annotation. We map reads to these intergenic regions to estimate the background noise of expression. Can you think of any limitation using this approach? I, I give you a minute or two to answer that. And no worry, I know it's a tricky question. We have only a few people answering, showing that the question is quite tricky. So thanks for the three people uh, who dare answering right now. So I don't think we're gonna have more people answering apparently. So uh, if I read your answer, correct annotation of intergening land express regions, viability in proportion of free intergenic expression between cell types and tissues, uh, bias in annotation and technical viability in library preparation in different experiments that may affect sequencing of intergenic regions and may affect the threshold determination. Okay, so I, I see kind of two answers here. So the first one is bias in annotation. And yes, uh, it's, a, it's totally correct. So uh, for human, mouse, uh, Drosophila, Melanogaster, we have very well annotated genomes. And we are pretty confident that the intergenic regions do not include unannotated genes. But for some other species, so we have a lot of genomes being, genomes being published uh, now. And, and lots of those genomes are not at the level of quality as the human or the mouse genome. So they miss a lot of genes. They are, these genes are unannotated and they are going to be considered as intergenic regions. And of course, these genes are going to be expressed. So it's going to skew our level of expression of what we consider intergenic. So the genome annotation is a huge limitation in this approach. And I'm going to show you how we address that. Uh, the other answer I see is viability in proportion of free intergenic expression, kind of the same answer here, like technical viability affecting the intergenic expression. But this is actually what we want here, is that this viability due to the, tech, to the library preparation is going to affect the gene expression as well. So if the preparation affected somehow the gene expression, the, it is going to be reflected in the expression level of the intergenic region. So if the laboratory preparation led to have more noise in the expression level, well, it is going to be reflected in the expression level of intergenic region. And it is exactly what we do to have an adaptive threshold uh, that accommodates any library and not a fixed threshold that will not deal with library with a high technical variability, for instance. So this is exactly the advantage of our approach that it is going to be taken into account by the intergenic level of expression. So getting back to this presentation, so about the genome annotation quality, uh, it is exactly the main limitation with this approach. So here for Macaca mulata, where the genome is less well annotated, in blue here, you have, so we took all the RNA-seq library that we had in BG and, and mapped them and look at the distribution of expression. And here, this is the intergenic region. And here, the intergenic regions are very skewed to the right and much more overlapping with the protein coding genes. And it shows that indeed, 
in these intergenic regions, we missed a lot of genes. There are a lot of LNFT genes that are actually expressed. And so it is not a good reference of the expression noise. So what we do in BG for that is that we do a deconvolution of these intergenic regions. And probably here, so I didn't look exactly in BG, but so here you see that we have several Gaussians going representing these intergenic region expression levels. And probably in BG, we are going to keep only the most left uh, distribution here, uh, the convoluted distribution, so that we are going to keep the intergenic regions only represented by these Gaussian here. And so in BG, using this method, we are going to have a subset of true intergenic regions that we are very confident that they do not contain any unannotated genes. So that our method is robust to the genome annotation quality. So I'm not going to give you more details about that, but just know that what we use in BG is not the default intergenic regions coming from the genome annotation. We are going to refine these intergenic regions to keep a subset of robust, true intergenic regions to estimate this background noise in the expression signal. Uh, so this method for calling genes present absent based on intergenic regions is available uh, in a bioconductor, bioconductor package that we released called BG Call. Uh, oh, and I kept a slide from last year, sorry. So there is no practical uh, this year about this package. Uh, and you can use this package uh, really easily for any species in BG, because for any species in BG, we would have provided this pre-computed true intergenic regions. If you want to perform such analysis on a species that is not in BG, then you will have to uh, provide these intergenic regions yourself. We have a method to do that. Uh, we have uh, a repository where you can upload your own set of true intergenic regions for you be used in the package as well. So if you use one of the 52 species in BG, it's going to be very easy. Uh, and if you want to do that on another species, we provide all the scripts and tools allowing you to do it, but it's going to be more work. Uh, so now going to moving to single cell RNA-seq. Uh, so for single cell RNA-seq, the, the most typical use is to perform cell type clustering so that you can identify cell types, new cell types. And it's not commonly used to identify uh, active signal of expression for genes in individual cells. So here is just a, a density plot showing the proportion uh, of genes expressed across for in an experiment uh, uh, expressed across all cells. For instance, here it shows, oh, sorry. So in this experiment, these genes here, they are expressed in all the cells from this experiment. And these genes here, they are expressed in none of the cells of this experiment. And you can see that you have a clear B model distribution here so some genes, if you look really at individual cell, the expression in cells of the same cell type is very, very close. Uh, it means that here, some genes are expressed in almost all cells in this given cell type, and some genes are expressed in none of the cells in this given cell type. So there is really a, a signal of expression that is very interesting to get from this single cell uh, RNA-seq data. So uh, here I show you like for full lens protocol. So you have kind of two type of, of single cell RNA-seq analysis. So one allows to sequence the full lens of the mRNA. Uh, and, and so you have, it's pretty much as the, the same as for bulk RNA-seq library. You just have like well-established PCR amplification steps, and, but it's pretty similar to bulk RNA-seq. And so when we look at the density plot I showed you earlier for bulk RNA-seq, so you can see it's pretty different, but still we still, have a, we still have a difference between the intergenic regions here and the protein coding genes here. We can still manage to, to make the difference. And we will look at the p-value distribution. Yeah, we have a, a, a p-value distribution that look like we can use that to define a threshold and notify genes that are actively expressed. So here I show you the percentage of protein coding genes considered as present from bulk RNA-seq in human and in mouse and from single cell full-length RNA-seq in human and mouse. So we have 
much less uh, genes considered as, uh, as present, but it's expected because we have much less read in these libraries, so 10 times less read uh, in this full length library, and we have much more genes that receive zero read. We have much more dropouts, so that will not allow us to quantify the gene expression. But still, our method can be used plug and play on full length single cell rna seq data. So for target based uh, single cell rna seq data, it's a different protocol. It allows to study much more cells at the same time. You can study hundreds of cells in just one experiment, but you will have much less reads per cell. So the, the classical approach, for instance, is you have beads where uh, PCR primer, cell barcode, unique molecular identifier, and poly DT tail are, are accessible like that. And through a, a microfluidic device, you will encapsulate one cell and one bead in droplets and, and then trigger the reagents and the reaction of sequencing just cell per cell, analyzing hundreds of cells at one time. Uh, so I'm going to skip that. But then you have much less reads. So if we look at the density plot here that I showed you earlier for bulk and full length rna -seq, well, here you have almost like no signal. And if we zoom in this little tiny area, this is here, well, we don't have any difference between intergenic coding, protein coding genes, because we have fewer reads per cell and more dropouts. So it's going to be difficult to use our method cell per cell. What we do is that in an experiment, we take all the cells mapped to a same cell type. So for instance, in an experiment, we have a B cell population. So a B cell population made of several cells. And we pool the RNSEC result of all these cells belonging to the same population. And then we can, again, recapitulate a signal where we are able to uh, distinguish between intergenic noise and active signal of expression uh, for, for, for genes. So, then we can estimate, okay, this gene is active in this cell population, and we then get back to individual cell again. So if we have one read map to a gene considered expressed in the population, then we are going to say, okay, this cell had one read, it is expressed in this cell. The take home message here is that for target-based protocol, we estimate gene activity at the population level, and then if it is, significantly expressed, we can get back to each individual cell of the population. Uh, considering the time I have left, I'm not going to provide you more, more questions. Uh, I'm going to be just a bit late. Uh, so I'm going to skip a lot of material. So here is just to show you that uh, using a naive cutoff approach, so it's a different unit, it's called CPM it, in target-based protocol, but Lots of authors use a knife cutoff on one CPM to consider gene as expressed. And we did uh, a pathway analysis when considering gene as expressed with this one CPM threshold or using our method. And what we observed, uh, you can see the result in this paper, is that this naive approach was missing a lot of pathway that are very important for B cell and that using our method, you identify this very relevant pathway in B cell, meaning in B cell, meaning that our approach provide a better true positive, false positive ratio that you are using this naive cutoff. Uh, and I'm going to try to wrap up, but basically, uh, yeah, just to recapitulate. So we have like from bulk rna -seq, we use a Z-score in terms of standard deviation. Uh, from the mean of reference intergenic regions that allow us to compute a p-value. Uh, so we use the same approach, plug and play for full length single cell rna data because we have enough reads in the libraries. And for target based, we pull cells from the same cell type in an experiment, and then we use the same approach. And after that, we can get back to individual cells. Just to mention that we have also affinitrix, ENC, in situ abilization data, and for all of these data, we produced a p-value. This is really our aim. You will see in the next presentation. Uh, for each gene in each sample, we provide a p-value 
considering the hypothesis of active expression as opposed to noisy random expression. Uh, okay, so VG produce expression calls p values of expression for each sample at the gene level. Uh, present expression call considering a significant p value represent expression of a gene over the biological and or the technical, technical noise. We produce that from all the data types integrated in BG. And we will also consider absent expression calls like reported absence of expression when the p-value is not significant. And we produce that only for a subset of the data type, uh, in situ abilization, affinitrix, aronesic, because for instance, we consider that for EST data, uh, for uh, target-based single cell RNA-seq data, we don't have enough reads to consider that when we don't have expression, uh, it's because it's not expressed. We consider that it might be because we just miss the expression. So absence of expression in BG is only inferred for some specific data types where we are confident that we have access to enough statistically significant information. And then how we integrate all this information to BG, that's going to be for the next presentation.